Today, it's my pleasure to talk with Professor Alan Watts. He's a professor of biological sciences at the University of Southern California. He hails originally from the UK, I gather. And he, he, his undergraduate work uh, was in Wales, in biology. Yeah. And yeah, then that's it. PhD was at Oxford in neuroendocrinology. And that's what Professor Watts is going to talk with us about today. And in particular, the signaling mechanisms from brain to body, body to brain, within the brain, circuits throughout the brain that control eating behaviors, which of course, eating is a big part of most people's lives still. And I think the, the listeners and viewers will be fascinated by actually how much of the brain is, is used in these process. Yeah. So Alan, uh, let, let's, why don't you kind of historical perspective on you? Uh, where did you grow up and what got you interested in science? Yeah, so I, I grew up in, in Sheffield in, in Northern England and I sort of first got involved, interested in science and particularly biology and even more specifically in physiology when I was at, at high school. Uh, the English system at that time meant by the time you got to 16 onwards, you started to focus on things. So I, I took three sciences at what was then called A-levels. And uh, that got you in a position to be able to go on to an undergraduate. And I sort of knew that I wanted to do, even then, that I wanted to do research. And sort of long story short, I ended up at a department in the University of Wales at, at Cardiff. And that, that particular undergraduate program was sort of interesting at the time because although the academic part of the college years were three years at that time, this was a four year course and it allowed you to, in the third year, to go out and actually spend an entire year in a lab. Yeah. So yes. I got interested in the hypothalamus actually as an undergraduate as we did the sort of a writing project on the hypothalamus. And I ended up at a, a lab at a, a medical research council research unit in South London that was focused on the sort of metabolic responses to brain trauma or to trauma. Mm -hmm. And I, I spent an entire year in a, a lab doing sort of front end research. I had a project that was involved with developing a radiomunoassay for insulin. So mm -hmm. uh, the sort of work that we do now is almost like a sort of a full circle. Anyway, I, 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 that was a very, uh, sort of a, a, a guiding time in my life. I went back and finished off my degree in Cardiff. And then I ended up, I wanted to do a PhD and I ended up doing a PhD in neuroendocrinology at Oxford. And the group I worked with was with a guy called George Fink, who mm -hmm. in Oxford, there was actually at the time, there was quite a, a good neuroendocrinology sort of core <laughs> faculty there, primarily because of a guy called Jeffrey Harris, uh, who was a, a pioneer neuroendocrinologist. George worked as a student with him. I worked with George. I ended up looking at, basically interested on in circadian timing signals on gonadotropin release mm -hmm. and uh, all these different patterns that were involved with ovulation in female rats. And that took me then interested in to, to neural circuits. And that's how I ended up as a postdoc with Larry Swanson, which was a very again, this very influential period. So I got involved with or interested in neuroanatomy, how you trace pathways. It was a very exciting time uh, back in the, this was the mid eighties. So I basically wanted to, to trace the pathways from the suprachiasmatic nucleus, which was the, is the master circadian clock and see how that linked with various physiological processes. And eventually because the sulk was a, because of the labs of a guy called Wiley Vale, who was yeah. basically, he, he, he pretty much, his group pretty much discovered all of the molecules that are involved with CRH and stress and what have you. I got sort of sucked into the paraventricular nucleus and CRH. And then when I set my own research pro program here at, at USC quite a while ago now, I, I got interested in, in thinking about how circuits and and what have you control the expression of these sort of basic behaviors and, 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 and the physiology that went along with it. And then that's how I got into where we are and 
where I am now, so to speak. Now, I I always say that I sort of started out in the pituitary, but I ended up sort of falling back down the vagus nerve because <laughs> really to understand a lot of these things, as you mentioned in the introduction, you sort of need to be able to understand that brain gut interaction and the details of all of that. So that's sort of basically where how I got to where we are now. Then let's start with, with the hypothalamus. And, it, it, you know, it has so many important roles in regulating the endocrine glands in the periphery, the adrenal glands. Um, it regulates energy metabolism, ap and appetite, uh, which is what we're going to talk about today. Sure. Can you talk about hormones that regulate appetite? Yeah. So... I mean, the sort of, in a way, the central role of the hypothalamus has been reckoned in these motivated behaviors, which is what we're sort of talking about with, with eating behavior. Uh, that's been recognized for, for decades yeah. and how it, it sort of interacts with, the, I mean, you have to have this close connection between the behavior and, you know, hormones that are needed to deal with the, almost the metabolic stress, if you like, that, that eating imposes on, on, the, on the body. So really, the, with regards to eating, you, you need a, 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 a it's the, the control of this is sort of an interplay between motivated drives, which if you want, we can talk about a, 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 a while, and all the signals that are coming back from the periphery, telling the brain how much energy stores we have, what's the status of the gut, what's the status of, you know, glucose absorption and this sort of thing. So, you know, the main players really in that and the one, and the one hormone really that was in a way, set this whole revolution in, in where we are now in understanding eating behaviors is leptin. Yeah. And that was discovered almost 30 years ago. And that is basically the, the signal that informs the brain of what the status of adi ad adipose stores are. Um, and then, so the, the leptin, when you eat a meal, uh, leptin is release from fat cells what's it where no it it's from? it's really it's so le leptin is more of a long-term signal it's sort of setting the tone or the gain in or in the brain as to where the, the body's fat stores are mm. and in fact in terms of activating eating the most important kinetic if you like or the dynamic of, of leptin is when leptin levels fall really low because that, that is the brain is then saying, hey, these leptin levels are now low. And this means the, the fat stores are getting smaller. And so we need to eat. We need to, we need to uh, sort of replenish these fat stores. So that the decline of leptin is the real important signal with regards to what uh, the activation of, 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 of eating. And oh, so, so, the, so then that's a little different than I learned a while ago where ghrelin which is a hormone yeah. that increases during fasting or right uh, is the the hunger hormone right yeah i mean I, i'm sort of i must admit i don't like attaching sort of labels yeah. like that i mean it's very it's very useful in understanding the general concepts but yes ghrelin is in fact the only hormone that will actively promote food intake and that's released from the stomach. And I think there's some release from some of the, uh, I mean, actually mostly from the stomach. And that will actively engage mechanisms to, to promote eating behaviors. So it's a little, sort of a crossover thing. You know, it's like many behaviors and many, many physiological behaviors that are sort of active mechanisms pushing one way and their active mission pushing, putting the other way. And how they operate in this sort of push pull is you know determines the outcome of a of whether a behavior is progresses or behavior stops so the other the other uh uh so leptin i guess and ghrelin are the, are the are the main ones there but then of course you also have the brain wants to know about what the status of you know circulating glucose is and a precipitous drop in glucose also activates eating behaviors because there you want to you know, really want to be able to get that glucose which is a one of the major major oxidizable fuels you want to get it into the system as fast as possible so so hypoglycemia acts as a stimulus for eating in humans at least 
it's actually very rare. It's not something that you come across very often because there's lots of mechanisms always pushing glucose back into this normal range. And in, in terms of, in, uh, you know, feedback suppression of eating, so that I guess one doesn't overeat, there's another hormone, GLP-1. Yeah, it's so there's a no like peptide one. Yep, so there's a lot of this. So yes, that's important. Those these sort of satiety signals. And the, the signals coming back into the brain are a mixture of a number of different different ones. CCK, cholecystokinin, was probably the first one as a circulating peptide that was discovered back in the 1980s. And then GLP-1, which is released uh, from enteroendocrine cells, these specialized neuroendocrine cells in the, in the lining of the gut, and they're, they're activated to release GLP-1, um, and actually other hormones as well, uh, just by as glucose is passing through the, uh, the, the, the gut and the and, uh, and, and endothelium, endothelial cells. Yeah, GLP-1 so, is particularly interesting to me because it, it has multiple actions. It acts on pancreatic beta cells to promote insulin uh, release, right. and it acts on, um, on muscle cells and liver cells to promote glucose uptake yeah. in those cells. It's a very, it's a, it's an, it's a very important hormone. It's, it's, it's one of the mem um, uh, family of peptides called incretins, which as you say, um, stimulate insulin secretion. So as you, as you are absorbing glucose into the uh, into base into the high, high, uh, hepatic portal vein, um, there are these signals which come along to sort of get insulin secretion up to sort of you know put insulin where it needs to go, basically in, into uh, hepatocytes and into uh, liver cells. Uh, sorry, into muscle cells and what have you. But actually, the most important incretin uh, is is actually uh, GIP, oh. which. <laughs> <laughs> the name escapes me now. It's this is another one of these incretin peptides, and the reason that is more important than GLP one is the fact that um, GLP one is taken out of the uh, circulation by the liver and by a, a set of enzymes in the blood called mostly DPP four, which is a, uh, a a protease sort of thing. So GIP actually gets all the way around the circulation to the uh, to the beta cells whereas glp1 the most important signaling pathway for glp1 is actually by way of the vagus nerve so endings close to the gut have glp1 receptors which detect this released glp1 and that activates mechanisms up into the brain through the vagus nerve so it's a very complex situation yeah. All right, so the hypothalamus is receiving receiving some of these signals from from fat cells, from fat stores, the amount of fat stores, glucose status, and so on. And then, but to have a motivated behavior that is actually trying to find food, acquiring food, deciding what you know is this something I should be eating or not, and then if it is eating that. How do the, there has to be signals then, uh, I guess, from the hypothalamus upwards? Right. So that's, that's sort of, um, this is where, that, where it sort of gets interesting because you, you raise a number of, of different questions here. And really, when you think about eating behaviors, there are what we've sort of thought of as, as three different types of behaviors. One of them is sort of re reactive eating. So this is a, an emergency, you know, it's in response to all of these signals coming up from the periphery and what have you telling you, no, energy stores are low, glucose levels are falling, you'd better eat pretty soon. So what you get after, for example, in, in rodents, if you do an overnight starvation, you take the food away, you put food in front of them the next morning, which is not a time they would ordinarily eat, they'll eat voraciously. So what's happened there is that all of the signals that have been telling the hypothalamus and actually the hindbrain as well that energy stores are, f are falling. You know, uh, in small rodents, you know, the, the, the amount of adipose tissue can, can vary quite dramatically. And so the animal's been pulling on stores to keep glucose up. Uh, 
So you'd better eat straight away. So that's that's one aspect of eating. And back in the day, that was that was the sort of form of, of feeding or for eating that was most studied in terms of mechanisms, because it was sort of the easiest one to promote. But of course, ordinarily, if there's, there's, there's adequate food sources, animals don't eat like that. You know, we eat what you might call habitual eating or spontaneous eating is another, another way to look at that. And that's if you've got stores that are food all the time, rodents eat in periodically uh, in ordered meals. That when the lights go out, that's they're nocturnal animals. That's when they eat. So there, you've got different mechanisms. So there is a circadian signal to do that, uh, and there are, uh, you know, sort of a, a lot of balances in there. There might be a small falling glucose that's detected that stimulates eating in those responses. So that is all there. I mean, the idea of that is that you are eating to prevent an energy deficit. So it's an anticipatory sort yeah. of thing. And then the third form is what we call sort of opportunistic eating. And that is where all of a sudden you remember that, you know, I remember that, that memory of that, that really nice meal I had wherever. And it's like, you know, I'm sort of feeling a bit peckish sort of thing. And you go out and you eat or, you know, you come across a favored food item in the environment. And it's like, hey, that looks good. So that is then you you pulling on information from learning and, and memory, and if you this if, if you're wanting to say go out and and find a food source as you're sort of thinking about it, then you've got to engage navigation systems. You've got to engage memories of of where you know your food supply is. This this type of thing. So there's at all different levels depending on the the form of eating that that is there. So that's when it gets complicated. And the yeah. hypothalamus is sort of um, prioritizing eating behaviors at the expense of, of other behaviors. And that's what the base, so there are, you know, there are control, what we call control networks for all of these different motivated behaviors embedded in the hypothalamus. And the, the behavior that has the highest motivational priority is the one that is going to the hypothalamus is going to engage the motor systems and navigation systems to go out and fulfill that particular need and then you can sort of switch ar around so if eating is the highest priority uh behavior because of either a deficit or it's the time of day that you want to do then those are the, the that's those the, the 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 networks in the hypothalamus are those that are going to organize the behavior for the animal yeah you you mentioned the importance of memory and and the you know your, the previous experiences of the the person or animal with regards to food location right and so on. I had um, I had multiple podcasts talking about the hippocampus. I had Jim Kinnearum at Hopkins talking about right. spatial navigation, which obviously finding food <laughs> is critical. You know where is it located? And then I had um, Sheena Jocelyn who's done some nice work on trying to establish what's an engram or memory trace. Um, so are th there must be connections then between the hippocampus and hypothalamus. Yes, yeah, there are. I mean, back in the day, you know, when neuroanatomy and what have you and, and wasn't quite as well developed, there was the, the idea that there might be cortical inputs uh, into the hypothalamus was, mm -hmm. was difficult to find. But now we know that that's absolutely there for sure. So there are uh, there are projections in from the hippocampus uh, into directly into the, the hypothalamus, and those project uh, there's a projection certainly into the lateral hypothalamic area, which is probably the most complex part of the hypothalamus, and th that that allows uh, engagement there. But there's also ascending projections as well. My uh, my colleague from uh, USC, Scott Konoski, has done some very nice work showing that there are influences from the vagus nerve with regards to hippocampal mechanisms. He's done a lot of work on looking at how learning and memory involved with organizing uh, complex behaviors with regards to eating. So uh, he's actually been able to trace uh, pathways coming up from the vagus nerve into the the the, the hind into the medulla 
and those are sort of projected by way of a various chains up into the into the hippocampus. The hippocampus also has receptors for ghrelin and it has receptors for GLP-1. And it has, I think it also has leptin receptors. So it's in a position there to be able to sample what's going on. So circulating leptin is certainly able to, uh, and, and ghrelin are certainly able to sort of communicate with various parts of the, the hippocampus. GLP-1 is sort of a different proposition. It's a very, it's a sort of a complex peptide because it's one of these peptides that not only does it circulate in the blood, but there are also neurons in the, in the medulla which synthesize GLP-1. So there's a whole GLP-1 peptide signaling network in the brain. And uh, it's, it, that, that, will, that will suppress food intake. It will suppress uh, uh, eating behaviors. And well, so uh, that again, must be... Do you know if anyone's looked from an evolutionary perspective of, you know, when did those uh, GLP-1 producing neurons in the brainstem first evolve? Because That's a good question. You know, this, I don't know. It kind of reminds us, right, of, of uh, uh, norepinephrine. Right. And, and serotonin, which are two neurotransmitters. And some people may not realize Actually, there's a very relatively few neurons that produce serotonin or norepinephrine, and they're all located in the the, the brainstem. Right, exactly. But, but they're the axons just spread all over the brain. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So the GLP one neuronal system is sort of very is quite analogous to that. There are actually not that many neurons back in the in the in the medulla which produce GLP one. And they, they project all over the brain. So as you, you know, rightly say, there are these ascending real big networks of, 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 of neurons. We've, we've worked a lot on the catecholamine projections into the hypothalamus with regards to, to sort of energy balance and control. But the GLP-1 system is, is an important one because that is the, the primary target, I think, of all of these new drugs that are coming along that are based on GLP-1 signaling. So they're not, the, the, the key point is that they're not really mimicking circulating GLP-1. What they're doing is that because they cross the blood brain barrier, they're able to engage central GLP-1 signalings and those are able to suppress uh, food intake. Yeah. It does so by way of the, those projections that, 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 you, that you mentioned. And yes, that, that there's those projections into the, the hippocampus, which may be involved uh, with, again, sort of organizing or, or biasing the way hippocampal information is used to direct a particular behavior. Um, one of the things I should mention that, that, this, that comes out of uh, particularly Scott Konoski's work is the fact that some of these the way that some of these peptides get around inside the brain may not simply be point-to-point -point synaptic transmission. Some of these things are actually released into the CSF. So they communicate more by what's called volume transmission, which is a sort of a whole parallel signaling mechanism that say parallels the point-to-point -point neuronal huh. synaptic thing. So it gets complicated. <laughs> You mentioned you've done quite a bit of work on norepinephrine. And right. What, you know, this, can you summarize some of that sure. in relation to food intake? Yeah. So, as I mentioned, or, you know, as we just talked about, these ascending catecholamine projections, of which there are many, um, provide a, a, into the hypothalamus at least, and, and into these key regions of the hypothalamus that are able to control eating behaviors. It's a massive input. And one particular sort of cell group in the in the, the hypothalamus, which we've worked on, or I've worked on for 30 odd years really, is the paraventricular nucleus. And this is one of the key regions in the hypothalamus that is able to uh, to help control eating behaviors, but it also controls a lot of neuroendocrine and autonomic functions. And the biggest input pretty much into this nucleus is these ascending catecholamine uh, projections. 
And what they seem to do, and what was most of the work has been on, is that this ascending projection, if you have a sort of a catastrophic fall in blood glucose, um, these neurons are activated and they, they into the hypothalamus and they do basically two things in the hypothalamus. One of which is that they increase glucocorticoid secretion, which is a hormone that is involved with bringing glucose back up to its normal range. But they also stimulate eating behaviors very rapidly. So this was really pioneering work by my uh, colleague at uh, uh, Washington State University, Sue Ritter. And she worked on this for, for, for many, many years. So if you stimulate, or, or sorry, if you remove this projection and you can do this with sort of specific neurotoxins, you take out this projection to the hypothalamus, you challenge the animal with hypoglycemia and it doesn't eat. It doesn't have a glucocorticoid response. So that's, we've used that system to help um, identify how these in, inward projections control in, in the paraventricular nucleus, at least these CRH neurons, which are involved with glucocorticoid. Okay, I see. Yeah, yeah. But this, just one other thing. So this, this ascending catecholamine projection doesn't only do that. It also helps protect against the what would be a, the metabolic stress of eating a high calorie diet so it turned and this is a much longer term sort of control mechanism if you in, if you go into positive any energy balance for a long periods of time then what happens of course you're taking in more nutrients that you need to make atp so the, the body stores it so it turns out that animals are very good at adapting to this and, and limiting their adiposity increase. Because so in an intact animal, what it will do is it need, it changes to a, a, a mechanism where it needs more calories to make the same amount of fat. Yeah. So it's, it's sort of limiting, you know, the fat production. Well, if you take out this ascending catecholamine projection, that, that ability is gone. So these animals get much, much fatter on the same calories as it does an intact animal. So there's this long-term control of energy balance as well. So they're involved with a lot of different things. And, um, you know, with regards to the overeating, uh, obviously there's this notion and actually evidence that people can be addic come addicted to certain types of food. At least, yeah. you know, Nora Volkow, who's the, Director of the uh, National Institute on Drug Abuse has suggested that or reported it with regards right. to, to um, what's happening in the reward circuits, the dopamine yeah. system. Yeah, this is this has been this this notion is actually I mean, the start of all of this was actually very instructive, I think, to the whole field of, of you know, sort of what we're back in the day calls physiological psychologists uh, as i mentioned that the early work on this all the people really looked at was the mechanisms involved with the response to starvation and as you know the time but certainly in the 70s and definitely going into the the 80s people recognized that there were you know what what is it that makes us want to eat something or wants a particular reward and you know this notion of a a reward circuit which I personally, I'm not too keen on the term, if you like, because I think it, 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 it simplifies what is a very complex situation. But, you know, generally speaking, if you want to think about this reward circuit, how does that involve with, with food intake? And clearly, it's an absolutely essential part of it, because, again, it provides that, if you want this incentive, the drive to go and, you know, you like food. We all like food. So there's definitely a notion of that. And... A lot of the early work on, on drug addiction, when people were identifying the role of dopaminergic projections from the midbrain up into the nucleus accumbens and really working all that out uh, with regards to, 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 to drug addiction, it was very useful actually to, to then think, well, maybe, you know, are these same, they seem circuits involved with what with, with food intake and, and, and the, the work of, of Bart Hobel and then uh, Anne Kelly at Wisconsin really took that notion and, and, and 
which found that yes, these same uh, mechanisms that are sort of engaged in during you know drug use and and, and what have you are, are used then, and it makes makes perfect sense. I mean, you know, if you like, you know, drug abuse is not something that is ordinarily found in the natural world. So these these circuits are are involved there to really you know push us towards a goal when we really need to do that. So, but then it got, it got a little at least to my mind, a little more confusing because the idea of, of, of drug addiction clearly is, is it's there. And, um, but I, I think the idea of it drift, addiction drifting over to food and saying, you know, you get addicted to cer certain foods, I think it gets a little, a little complicated and maybe even a little, maybe even a little misleading. Okay. I think the way that we, that, that I would look at it is that these are embedded circuits that are really there to, to push motivated behaviors towards the goal that, that you need so like i mean the two key ones obviously are, are eating behaviors and, and and sexual reproduction huge very very strong drives and what happens with when you have drug abuse those those pharmaceuticals the, the drugs basically hijack those circuits and push them way way to one side so i think the the, the idea and the research behind looking at drug abuse and, and addiction has been extremely helpful to understanding how those circuits work within motivated behaviors. And it's not really a surprise, you know, that mm -hmm. those engaged in, in eating are the same ones that are engaged in, in, in you know, drug addiction and, and behaviors there, because they said they've been pushed to the extreme by, you know, whatever drug is around. And in, in obesity, are there abnormalities in the signaling from body to hypothalamus and hypothalamus to body? So that, yes, there are. And in fact, eating a, a high fat diet will change the signaling properties within the, within the vagus nerve. And, uh, you know, the vagus nerve is, is, is a, a, most of the vagus nerve is sensory. And it's, it's not just from the, the GI tract, it's, it's from all over the, the periphery. And it's the, those neurons are loaded with this, the sensory neurons of the gut are loaded with these receptors for peptides like GLP-1 and, and all the rest of it. And the proportions or the signaling properties within those neurons is changed by eating a high fat diet for, for sure. Um, what's happening in the hippocampus in, in uh, sorry, the hypothalamus, yeah, you, yes, you can find a lot of changes in, in there. And uh, in humans, it's a little more tricky to, to look at. Most of the work in humans has looked at uh, the way, uh, you know, sort of a, an, an obese person versus a, if you want a, a, a normal or a, a, a lower body mass uh, person, response to images of food. And that's very clear. You know, most of that's tracked with MR, functional MRI. And, and that's, I think, is, 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 is clear that, that that does change. So that means that the way that uh, uh, you know, uh, obesity influences the way that you process that type of sensory information uh, changes. And of course, that can then sort of inform hypothalamic mechanisms and all of the others in terms of how you respond to, to food. It's very complicated, <laughs> sure. Now, uh, most people know about insulin resistance, right? And which is the uh, imperability of cells, for example, muscle cells, liver cells to respond to insulin. So that even though insulin is there, and actually it's often higher than- Right, that, very high, yeah. Um, the cells aren't removing glucose from the blood, so you get an elevation of blood glucose. But there's also something called leptin resistance, where the, the neurons in the hypothalamus that normally respond to leptin have, don't respond very well, and right. so they, they stop, or, you know, yeah, stop eating signal isn't working so well. Right, exactly. Yeah, that's, that's actually a, 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 very, a very good point. Um, so, as I mentioned at the beginning, the discovery of leptin in the, in the mid-90s was a, an absolute 
or eye opener for all of us who work on these sort of metabolic control mechanisms because it was such a powerful hormone yeah. for suppressing food intake. Yeah. Um, but as you mentioned, the the the, the, the you get this what well, you know this insulin resistance, which is you know basically the brain once to get the in, in leptin rises to a certain level, the brain really doesn't care how high it goes because again back in the, the the natural world it's this notion that the fall in leptin is the more physiologically important signal so mm -hmm. as, as as fat stores get used up because of you know you're you're in negative energy balance you're using all of your fat stores to maintain blood glucose levels and, and, and what have you then adipose tissue can disappear so leptin totally disappears so what that does is promote eating behaviors and but as you put on more and more more weight more adipose tissue the brain doesn't care about it because over ev <laughs> evolutionary time that's not been a uh, a real challenge you know with starvation is what's the, the main challenge that's yeah. what all your physiological signals are there for and, and, and you know when leptin first came along there was this notion that hey you know if we can find a pharmaceutical way to engage those leptin receptors yeah. then we've got a way in maybe to help control obesity and it sort of in the end it really didn't work because of that as you say that leptin resistance the, the, once you get to a certain level the brain doesn't doesn't care really so yeah. now so if you talked about some retrograde signals that I don't know, the vague up the vagus nerve so these there's ac axons from neurons in the periphery, say, uh, in the neural network in the gut that course through the vagus nerve uh, up to the brain stem. Right. Then are they, how are they getting to the, say, hypothalamic centers right. or, or higher centers? Right. Yeah. So that's, that's, so as you, as you said, that the, these, the vagus nerve contains a lot of these different types of sensory neurons. So they have nerve endings all over the gut. They have nerve endings in the stomach wall. They have nerve endings actually in the hepatic portal vein wall. And all of those neurons, they're sensing different aspects. So for example, in the stomach, you get distension when you eat a meal. Well, that distension is signaled to, to the brain. And we mentioned earlier, talked about GLP-1, this GLP-1 that's released from those enterendocrine cells in the wall of the intestine with regards to you know, increased uh, absorption, they signal as well. Same with the portal vein. Once glucose gets into the portal vein, those nerve endings and the vagal endings, and they're all up to brain. So yes, the hindbrain or the medulla is accessing all of this information. And there are what what are most likely or the, the easier way to describe it is like a reflex loop so that information is processed in the in the hindbrain and in, in the medulla and it can activate systems going back down into the periphery without it ever going up into to your to your uh oh, you know, higher see. parts of the brain so these reflex loops are doing that but they only can do so much so yes the the hypothalamus which as we've discussed is is a the major player in organizing motivated behavior so those inform that information coming up the vagus nerve is actually going to be very helpful to the hypothalamus to to get it in order but it's not going to receive that information directly there are these That's neurons we yeah. talked about some of them actually the glp1 projections catecholamine projections there's a whole other range of these brain neurons in the hindbrain which sample this vagal information and then pass it on up into the brain. So we, we've sort of made a point in uh, all, all along that the hypothalamus is able to sample information of two different types. We've talked about circulating glucose, we've which means glucose sensing mechanisms in the hypothalamus. We talked about leptin and ghrelin. You know, the hypothalamus can sense those directly from the, from the, the blood. But if it's going to know about what's going on with regards to stomach distension or what's going on to G peripheral GLP-1 signaling, it needs that those ascending connections. So that's how the 
hypothalamus and even the, you know further forward if you like up into the cortex these ascending projections tell those regions what's going on in the periphery by from the, that information coming up the vagus very important all right so moving that kind of forward forward in the brain how you know you have all, all this information is coming in to the brain and how how is a decision decision made then in terms of you know do i eat this um you know where do i go to get food and those kinds of things what circuits are involved in the decision yeah. aspect? well that's that again is that's a, an absolutely fundamental question and the the the, the easy answer is that we really don't know in, in or the, the detailed answers we really don't know i mentioned earlier that that the hypothalamus has this ability to control a lot of, of basic motivated behaviors i mean reproduction um certainly obviously eating behaviors but also sort of agonistic or interaction behaviors conspecific behaviors how how animals interact territoriality maternal behavior all of this type of stuff a lot of that is is organized within the hypothalamus so there sort of has to be ways for those and each one of those seems to be controlled by different networks in the hypothalamus and we've sort of uh tried to identify this eating control network uh in in the hypothalamus which consists of interactions between you know different parts of the hypothalamus paraventricular nucleus is is certainly one of them a nucleus called the arcuate nucleus which has been absolutely central in uh thinking about how eating behaviors are controlled a lot of work done on the beautiful work done on the arcuate and parts of the lateral hypothalamic area so the, the there's a lot of parallel work showing that there are other parts of the hypothalamus that are involved with these sort of agonistic behaviors, territoriality, fighting, for example, or involved with conspecific behaviors for uh, reproduction, you know, mating and, and all of these things. And there are other regions that are not involved with eating behaviors that are in, involved there. So the idea is that we should be able to construct or identify these different control networks and presumably, or at least we're sort of uh thinking that these networks will have to talk to one another and that these these connecting nodes are what's saying you know what we really need to prioritize eating at this moment but then you eat for a certain amount of time and then the, 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 you can back off and then you're going to do something else so the arcuate nucleus is sort of a very interesting nucleus in this regard because it may act as a connecting node between networks that are involved with eating and networks involved with reproductive behaviors as i said there's a huge amount of work being done on the arcuate that it shows it's an absolutely pivotal nucleus for that but the arcuate nucleus is also involved with the release of luteinizing hormone during ovulation so that it controls the pattern or helps control the pattern of, of release of LH luteinizing hormone, which you have with female rats need for ovulation. So you've got these two what seemingly different mechanisms that the arcuate nucleus can do. So I think that probably what we're going to see is that there are other nodes that are able to do this. Uh, yeah. The ventromedial nucleus is one of them that comes to mind because that again is being heavily implicated in control of energy balance and the control of blood glucose but in terms of behavior it's much more important for agonistic behaviors so again some beautiful work from uh back in the day from david anderson at caltech showing if you optogenetically stimulate parts of the uh uh, the uh, ventromedial nucleus, you can switch between mating behaviors and fighting. So, you know, these types of things, I think, are what's going to come out as being the important links to, to, to basically prioritize motivated behaviors. But we really don't know yet quite. We, we're sort of getting there. 
as to how these things are put together. And, and during human brain evolution, uh, the evidence suggests that the brain region that increased in size most was the prefrontal cortex. Yeah, for sure. And I had, um, actually, I've got a book, uh, Neurobiology of the Prefrontal Cortex by um, Passingham and Wise. And then I had uh, Michael Platt okay. talk about this, but uh, Passingham and Wise put forward this hypothesis that a lot of the, the reason the prefrontal cortex expanded so much is it plays an important role in, in foraging and decision-making during foraging. For example, if you're in a patch of whatever, wild raspberries, and you're eating raspberries, and they're starting to dwindle down in numbers. How do you decide to stop, you know, trying to scrounge up a few more there and, and go try to find another patch, which you may or may not find? Right. Um, and there are, there are definitely connections of the prefrontal cortex with learning and memory centers. Yeah. I think hap hypothalamus as well. Yeah. Yeah. You sort of touch on that. So, I mean, that's to me, that's a, again one of these absolutely fascinating. Uh, aspects of, of of how you try to understand how these these networks are put together and what do they contribute to a particular eating behavior. And you 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 touch on an actually very important point, I think, and that you know for the most part everybody thinks of eating behavior as what is as food intake. So you've already got the food in front of you, and you then engage all of the motor patterns that you need to to eat the food. But of course, getting to the food source, deciding that that's what you want to do, the what's called the, the uh, 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 or has been called in the past, the appetitive actions involved with that are really critical. Foraging behavior is absolutely essential to this. So uh, it's all part of that long, I mean, the, the, oh, over a hundred years ago, a guy called Wallace Craig broke down the sort of temporal order of these motivated behaviors into an appetitive phase, which is like you go out and forage and what have you and, you know, all animals have a different way of doing this. Individuals have a different way of doing it. It's very, it's very species specific. It's very individual specific to where an individual is. Then you've got the consumatory act and that's not consuming. That's the consummation of the behavior and you actually eat and then you get the termination of the behavior and you do something else. So a lot of what we've done in the, in the eating behavior field is focused on the uh, the, the consumatory part, the consummation of this. But as you mentioned, you know, the foraging behavior is a real aspect of that. And we're really now only getting into really being able to study that in any great detail. And yes, prefrontal cortical, to cortical mechanisms, connections with the hypothalamus, connections with the amygdala are really key in all of this. And yes, that information can channel down back to, uh, you know, into the hypothalamus. And it, but it goes the other way as well. So now, nowadays, this is what we use for foraging. That's right. You know, we got <laughs> restaurants near me, and yeah. then plug in your GPS. Yep, or so Uber Eats or something. We're going we're to lose those circuits, I think. Well, maybe, <laughs> I doubt it. I, I, I doubt it. Uh, uh, you know, if, if, if you if you if you if you lose your phone. I think you're going to find ways to, uh, to to go out and find a food source. You know, go around to the nearest supermarket or whatever. You probably can do. It. Even if you if you lost the, you know, you couldn't drive there. You're still going to walk there. So yes, I think that that's. But you bring up a very interesting point because what that means is that human foraging behavior is very different. You know, as they say, you use your phone, and hey presto, the guy shows up at your door with you know, your little bag of food or whatever, or you get directions to go to the nearest restaurant. It's, but it's, it's still the same thing. Yeah. You know, in principle, at least anyways. Yeah. <laughs> now, you know, in preparation for this uh, podcast, I read through and it took me a long time, your uh, extensive review and physiological reviews for viewers and listeners who never heard of physiological reviews. It's, it's really historically a, a prominent, one of the most prominent uh, journals that publishes re comprehensive review articles on particular subjects. And, you know, some of everything we've talked about so far 
pretty much, except I don't think you mentioned cell phones, but, <laughs> but you know, we, it, there's more detail and I'm going to put a link in the description section of the podcast to that article. All right. Yeah. People Thanks. will be able to click on it and get the full text P PDF. But you start out, you start out the article not talking about these signaling mechanisms through the nervous system so much or the hormones, but talking about how individual cells themselves regulate energy. Uh, and you know, ATP is sure. energy currency. Do, do you want to? It's going to be hard for this audience, but sure. can you kind of summarize some of the yeah. sensors and. Yeah, I think. I mean, I think it's a. I mean, it's. If you explain it correctly, and maybe I will or I won't. It's like the principles are are, are pretty straightforward. As as you say, this molecule ATP, adenosine triphosphate, is is the energy currency. That's what cells use to generate energy and the, and the basic notion is that the reason you eat from an energetic point of view is to provide fuel to produce ATP. That's the absolute bottom line on that. So I, I, uh, the, one of the fundamental principles in a lot of uh, you know, eating behaviors and bioenergetics and all the rest of it in, well, actually, in physiology, is homeostasis, yeah. and this is this principle that was identified and first described by uh, a, a eminent, very eminent physiologist a hundred years ago, Walter Cannon, and he proposed that these regulated variables, things like blood glucose, things like uh, fat stores, were so important. These, these variables were so important that they were maintained within a sort of a narrow limit. It wasn't saying that they kept at exactly the same level, but they were maintained within a, what's a controlled range. And that there were mechanisms there if the, drip, the variable drifted outside, there's mechanisms to push it back. If it dropped too far, mechanisms to push it back. Body temperature is another one, that's just the principle. So, when we got to th thinking about and say homeostasis was a very important principle when people started to look at how about eating behaviors and the idea was that yes signals that we've talked about dropped down it was telling the brain that you know the stores are getting low let's replenish them so this homeostasis thing is is absolutely central so as we were putting this this review together it's like so okay you've got eating behaviors what they do is that they are some of these are described as homeostatic. There's all these home. So, what is the controlled variable? What is it that eating is is trying to maintain within this narrow range? Well, you know, blood glucose is one of them. But actually, blood glucose drifts wildly outside that range. You try to maintain it there, but then, okay, what do you use glucose for? Well, if you lead it all the way back, what glucose is doing is maintaining. ATP availability. And that is the absolute, what we've called the apical or the, the, the apex control variable. And this, this, the person's work who really influenced our thinking about this is a guy called Mark Friedman, who about 14, 12, 13 years ago, wrote this beautiful article saying that the ATP was this central variable. So we use that concept uh, to, to, you know, to think about it. And in fact, <laughs> not sure we want to get into this, but it, it's the nuances of, of, of terminology, control and regulation. These, these terms are sort of banded around almost interchangeably, but yet there's a lot of thought in physiology that they're not interchangeably mean different things. So a regulated variable ATP is maintained within its narrow range and cells will do this. They, they monitor and sense the ATP in the cell, and there's a an enzyme called uh, AMP kinase, and this alternates in two different forms. It's inactive when it's not phosphorylated. You add a phosphate group onto it, it activates the enzyme, and it ends up converting AMP to ADP, which is the precursor of ATP. So cells use the all cells use this what's been called the, the 
universal energy sensor, this AMP kinase state thing. So turns out that there are certain neurons in the brain. I mean, all cells do this. I mean, whenever anybody's looked, all cells have this AMP kinase and they want to maintain the ADP, ATP to ATDP ratio at about 10 to one. You always need that ATP. So you can start, store glucose, you can store fat, you can store, if you like, amino acids in protein, all of these things. You can't store ATP. That has to be this, it has to be there. And the analogy that we describe in this review is that, okay, if you are starved, you don't eat food for three or four days, do you die? No, you really don't. You get very hungry. <laughs> you lose weight because you're using the stores. What happens if you stop ATP production? If you use a toxin like cyanide, <laughs> you're dead within seconds. Yeah. And the reason is you stop producing ATP, you're done. So that's why it's important to do that. So it turns out that there are certain neurons in the hypothalamus, in the arcuate nucleus, in the paraventricular nucleus, probably also in the lateral hypothalamic area, which can use the change in ATP, AMP kinase activity as a signal to go and eat. Mm. So it's clear that some cells and neurons in the brain are monitoring this ATP availability and using that as a signal to change uh, uh, eating behaviors. Things like glucose, and that I think also maybe ghrelin, are also able to interact with this enzyme to change its phosphorylation state. So to us, that was like, okay, that's the central thing. That's what is, is there. So that's sort of why we, we have this ATP concept that I think is absolutely pivotal. There's another set of neurons actually down in the hindbrain, which can do the same thing. You, you mess around with AMPK signaling in the hindbrain and it changes the way an animal will eat. Now, during, so, extended, yeah. during extended periods of food deprivation or, or voluntary fasting, uh, you know, glucose levels are maintained in the low normal range and ketone levels go up. Uh, they come from fatty acids. I had a podcast with Steve Cunane, actually a couple of them, talking about the ketones. And at least in the studies he's done where he's used a PET imaging with uh, radioactive acetoacetate, which is a ketone, and radioactive 2-deoxyglucose. And in the, the same human, you know, he's, he's had them switch from their normal diet to ketogenic state conditions. And the, the brain cells have a major switch in utilization of glucose to ketones. And ketones, I, I guess it depends how you look at it, but based on a per molecule basis, uh, more you get more ATP production from ketones than glucose and less free radicals. Right, right. So under these stressful conditions, and, and it is a stress, you know, fasting, food deprivation, it's very important stress. It's engaging a lot, of, you know, these things you've been talking about. Um, the ketones seem to, to have some important roles as well. Right, right. Yeah, so this is it's probably getting a little bit outside my wheelhouse sort of thing in terms of the uh, the signaling and, and and sort of and particularly in the, in the periphery of, of sort of you know fatty acid derivatives and what have you but um the the, the certainly the utilization of, of glucose by the brain is is sort of sort of critical and that's why we want to keep primarily why we want to keep blood glucose up at a certain level because the brain is using i think the percentage is like 40 percent of our total energy expenditure and everything is is from the brain yeah. so 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 you're saying that the, the in by switching over to ketogenic diet there are changes in brain metabolism is that that, that correct yeah it's a big big change i can i can send you a article or you mm. can you can look, sure. look listen to the podcast i did with them right um so yeah i mean it's um 
I think the the uh, the, the this idea of free fatty acids or or uh, fatty acid derivatives it's directly signaling to the brain. There's certainly evidence for that. There's actually a lot of work done in the on the arcuate nucleus as to whether this is, but it's it's. I'm not sure of the state of the field, as it were, because a, yeah. a lot of things focus more on glucose as the primary fuel yeah, for yeah. that. Yeah, and uh, it's very interesting. So the, you, you also, I mean, just as an aside, you raised about the idea of insulin resistance, and it turns out that insulin has actually very little role to play in the brain as a metabolic hormone. There's, there's certainly insulin sensing in the brain, but it seems to be more related to uh, changes in, in in behavior rather than insulin acting as a molecule that allows neurons to uptake glucose i don't think it works like that in the brain yeah it's a, it's a very different thing to the thing so yeah so basically glucose uh, seems to be the main thing now you made me think of uh igf1 insulin like growth factor one and it's very important uh in brain development and in regulating the growth of axons and dendrites and there's even some evidence that could be important for learning and memory. Okay. And in the periphery, it, it it's produced in response to growth hormone, right? By, by muscle cells. So it, you know, it it's probably important in regulating behaviors and adaptive plasticity in the brain. And there's some established links to energy metabolism as right. well. Yeah. So yeah. Again, that's this is uh, getting at the edge of my yeah, yeah. thing. But certainly, I mean, growth hormone is a is a good example. Obviously, growth hormone is during development is exactly what its name suggests. You know, so that's what's on the label. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's, 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 but what you know, it's plenty, we all have plenty of growth hormone, and it's it's in, in adults, it's a, a more of a metabolic sort of hormone yeah. involved there and and yeah there's lots of these signaling pathways igf you know the change as you grow into adulthood then they're still of use but there's probably signaling and, and operating in different ways yeah now let, let's finish up uh, i'll ask you what, what's your most exciting projects going on now <laughs> Well, it, it sort of harks back to me, to my mind, at least. Anyway, we we have a, a we have actually have a couple of of uh, NIH funded uh, projects going on at the moment. One is to do with um, hypoglycemia and the notion of how the brain responds, uh, uh, you know, to to generate these what are called counter regulatory responses. So the the mechanisms that if glucose falls down, then there's all these mechanisms to bring it back up again. Epinephrine release from the adrenal gland that stimulates the liver to uh, release, uh, produce glucose, glucocorticoid responses, glucagon, eating behaviors. So the brain is seeing or is able to respond to that through a series of glucose sensing mechanisms. There's one in the hypothalamus, there's another one down in the hindbrain, and there's one down in the hepatic portal vein. So we're interested in how these different, the information from these different glucose sensing regions is put together in the brain to, to generate that. So what we're doing at the moment is we're, we're, we're sort of uh, tagging off from a, what I think was a fundamental finding from a colleague of mine here at USC, Casey Donovan, who many years ago uh, found that if you, if you go into hyperglycemia very quickly, then you only need the brain sensors to generate these responses. If you go into hypoglycemia much more slowly, the brain needs to see that information from the hepatic portal vein. Now, slow onset hypoglycemia is really important for people with type one diabetes because their only therapy is insulin uh, replacement. And the biggest danger, the, the, the biggest threat to them are these hypoglycemic episodes. So in for type one, at least, this slow drop into hypoglycemia is really key. So the, the, blood, the hindbrain, sorry, the hepatic portal vein sensors are key for that. So our notion is what, what does the, how is the brain seeing 
rapid onset hyperglycemia versus slow onset hyperglycemia. So what we're doing is to um, basically challenge rats with these two different forms of hyperglycemia and then to map out the activity in response to that in, in, in neurons using a, a brain marker of activity. There's a, a protein called FOS, FOS, which has been used for years to track neural activation. So what's the pattern of FOS activation with fast onset versus mm. slow onset? Mm. And if we look throughout the brain, the idea is that we can map these um, different responses and then produce a, uh, basically we can log, we'll get into <laughs> an area of research that I really think is, is exciting, that's connectomics. And that is using a, uh, the, uh, basically a database of all brain connections together and feeding these FOS patterns into this to seeing how they might be connected hmm. and how they respond to this. So the, the, the physiological side, the brain activation, that's an ongoing project in our, in our lab. What we can also do is because uh, epinephrine is a key part of this. We can put a, a viral tracer into the adrenal gland and it, it's, it backtracks into the brain on a sort of a polyneuronal basis. <laughs> so it infects at one neuron and then inf in, infects the next neuron in the chain and the next one in the chain. So we can use this virus to see which where the control network is for the adrenal gland. <laughs> well, how does that relate to these this FOS activation patterns where a glucose drop stimulates epinephrine release how does that differ slow onset versus rapid onset so this is the sort of idea yeah. what, what we're doing with this and this got some this connectomics notion is that the, there are the, there's a, a huge set of work that's coming out from my colleague and was actually my postdoc mentor larry swanson and his collaborators, uh, Joel Hahn and Olaf Spawns, where they've got these, they're, they're building connector maps of the brain. It's like, an, if you think of it as a, like an airline network map all over the world, you know, where are the connecting hubs? You know, where's, you know, Heathrow Airport, JFK versus tiny airports? How are these interconnected? What's the strengths of the connections? So I think this is a really exciting, yeah. way, sort of big data, uh, so I think that that's a, a, an exciting way to go. But we'll see how we get on with it. <laughs> All right. Great. Well, I've enjoyed chatting with you a lot today, Alan, and uh, covered a lot of ground in a reasonable period of time. <laughs> yes. Well, I appreciate the chance to talk. I think I, I really i have enjoyed looking at these brain pondering podcasts uh, a lot. I think it's, it's, they're, they're really very good. So I'm, I'm, I'm very happy to be, to be involved with it. So thank okay. you. I'm glad. Okay, Alan. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye, Anne.